Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I am back. Uh, this is Charlie Sykes, obviously. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, Bill Crystal and Mona Chern sitting in for me yesterday. It was was not a big deal. Um, I had my second dose of the Moderna vaccine on Monday, and uh, because I'd read up enough about it, I knew that there were there's a possibility there might be some side effects. And so I had it about 1130 in the morning and nothing, nothing, nothing until the evening. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to be one of the lucky ones, I'm not going to have any side effects, woke up, felt like I'd been hit by a freaking truck. And so it, it lasted about 12 hours. But it was like, wow, that was that was way worse. It just is. You know, I was trying to think of how to describe it. It was like just having been beaten up by a gorilla, a gorilla with hammers. And so I spent most of the day drinking water, lying down. And then around dinner time, it just kind of went away. And so I'm fine. I'm ready to get back to life. Uh, appreciate the, the good wishes. But just so you know, if you're going to get the, that second dose, you might want to keep your schedule the day after a little bit on the light side. I actually, you know, had been invited to do a variety of things. You know, I, I don't, don't think that's a great idea. Maybe I'll do it when I'm feeling a little bit more human, but uh, that, that, that works. Uh, joining us back on the podcast again is Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who has been a very busy man lately. So uh, welcome back, Representative Kinzinger. Hey, thanks. By the way, when I got, I got the second dose of the Pfizer and I, I was down for two days, but they say, you know, younger, handsomer people are more likely to have like longer reactions, but it's no joke, but it was good to have it done. Well, apparently that's not true because I had the reaction too. So um, see, I was kind of figuring that. I was figuring, you know, not being a younger, handsomer guy, I would probably escape all of that. And it's like, wow. So um, you, we need to talk about Dr. Seuss, obviously. I mean, yesterday, the FBI director you know, was talking about the ongoing threat of domestic terrorism. You, you folks in Congress are debating $1.9 trillion relief package and voting rights. And president announced that he would have enough vaccine doses for the entire adult population by the end of May. But, but in, the, in the Republican hive mind, it's all Dr. Seuss all the time. There was one guy that counted up uh, Fox News. 139 mentions of Dr. Seuss on Fox News between 4 a.m. Tuesday and midnight. <laughs> just, and it was so big, it actually pushed the degendering of Mr. Potato Head out of the news. I mean, this, this, this was so bad that your leader, Adam, actually raised it on the floor of the House of Representatives during a debate about voting rights. Here's Kevin McCarthy. H.R. 1 rewrites election law and imposes a one-size-fits-all partisan rules from Washington. Under the Constitution, we generally defer to states and counties to run elections. Democrats want to change that. First, they outlawed Dr. Seuss, and now they want to tell us what to say. I don't know. I just it's So it really is all culture war all the time, isn't it? Yeah, that's what it feels like. You know, look, I think... I think the Dr. Seuss thing is stupid because, you know, with, uh, actually the history of him, he, when he wrote Horton Hears a Who, uh, it was actually because he was feeling guilty about, you know, some of the propaganda he did in World War II, and he wanted to make the point about people being people. And and uh, so there's a great history. I think the, I think stopping printing it's stupid, but I also don't think it's something that needs to drive the headlines of the culture no. war. And that's that's what's happened. This We've just fallen back to this culture war division as, as a way to somehow win again. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's always a bad idea anytime that you, you, you ban, burn, cancel, or don't publish a book because of the content. I just think that's, that's, you're generally always going to be on the right side. If you say, no, let's not be, let's not get involved in banning books. But on the other hand, this is one of those moments where it's like, what are the public policy implications of a private company deciding not to reprint books as opposed to everything that's going on here? And I, I think it's another indication of the way the sideshow has become kind of the main event for folks. And, and then I guess there's a reason why Republicans in Congress are not talking about Obamacare and health care anymore. Why they're not. I mean, it's a, think about all the things we could be talking about now. And yet it's 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 Dr. Seuss. Anyway, I mentioned before. Uh, you've, had a, you've had a really busy last two weeks. Um, you had the president of the United States call you out by name from the stage uh, in, in, in our land. I mean, you are officially on the on the president's enemies list, Adam. You know, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, usually enemies lists, I thought, were reserved for like Al Qaeda and uh, not 
fellow Americans and certainly not fellow Americans of your same party. But yeah, I had no doubt that, it, you know, I was going to be called out because he couldn't resist himself. And I mean, all you had, the only thing new in that speech from a speech he gave in September was he talked about a, the election being stolen in the past tense and he named names. And it's, you know, it's all, all these people that, that come up to me and say, you know, why are you why are you out there fighting? We need to show unity. It's like, yeah, I, you know, if there was a sense of unity being shown, uh, I would agree, but there's no unity being shown. It's like, we're going to show unity as long as we can cancel and kick out the people that frankly voted their conscience and are truly conservatives, not just, you know, these rhinos that uh, run, the, run the party and, and that Donald Trump is. I, I think it's worthwhile just dwelling on that irony a little bit, you know, all this, the canceling and the censuring of anybody that, that, that bucked the president. The whole theme now is about the cancel culture. That was the theme of, of, of CPAC. And yet, <laughs> isn't this the whole point of what Trump is doing in all of the state parties censure? You've been censured, right? Or have they oh, censured yeah. you? They, they've, they've, mm -hmm. they've, done, they've done that. And I, it's like every single person has been censured. As far as I know, nobody censured the uh, Republican Party hasn't censured Marjorie Taylor Greene or Madison Cawthorn or any of the others. But but you guys are being canceled. So the, the, the Republican Civil War apparently was canceled, according to Senator Scott, except what it's it's it, it's back on now as long as you're. The yeah, target. I think they're basically declaring trying to declare victory. And it's like, well, some people won't go away. And, you know, and that includes me. And here's the deal. You know, I got you look at like Southern Illinois, for instance, and uh, Mary Miller, she said the thing, you know, something that Hitler did well was, you know, on January 6th or something. And she never got censured. But some of the counties she represents that I, you know, are hours away from me censured me. It's like I, I tried to start the hashtag censure frenzy because that's what we're basically yeah. in right now. And and it's like, you know, look, I, I, if you censure me for voting my conscience, I think that says a lot more about you than me. And I don't lose any sleep except to say that this is obviously the reason that I think the battle for the heart and soul of the party has to be public because, you know, it's the public that votes and it's the public that's going to put new leaders in. OK, I wanted to play a soundbite of something you said the other day, um, you know, speaking <laughs> of, of CPAC, one of the rock stars of CPAC um, was Josh Hawley. Uh, one of the the senators who objected to the counting of the electoral vote, and he stood up there and and said, you know, I object, and he got a standing ovation. And, uh, and this is what you said on CNN the other day. All you had to do was see Josh Hawley's smug face at CPAC as he stood in front, you know, getting these this adulation from the crowd about how he. You know, you might have seen I rejected the like and everybody's and he's out there like feeling great about it. Like there are five people dead, two that took their own life on top of that as a result of what you did. It was embarrassing for us around the world. It's actually for me as a guy that's involved in foreign policy. It's been difficult for me to talk to other countries about how to do democracy in the wake of that. But as long as you're the most important thing and you can run for president, that's great. So. In my mind, look, I, I think these people like Holly are going to not be the contenders in 2024. I actually have an optimistic view of the future of the party, which I know is kind of hard to imagine now. But I hope we get some answers today. And, and you know, I, we need a dose of humility, too, I think. Not a lot of humility, not a lot of optimism. What what could possibly make you optimistic about the future of the Republican Party when you see what happened down at CPAC, which was kind of the insurrection after party and Josh Hawley bragging about his role in the insurrection and getting a standing? How could you be optimistic? It's just Jesus. Uh, that's the only reason. Now, <laughs> look, I think, I, I mean, when you see, so, okay, it, you know, if you, believe in God and you look at what happened at CPAC and you say, okay, if the devil is, is out there going, which I believe he's like trying to discredit Christianity through all of this, but you're going to sit there and say, I got a great idea. I'm going to bring a golden Trump statue. It's as close to, oh. you know, the 32nd, is it Ezekiel or whatever it is of, of just worshiping the golden calf. And then people worshiped it. They literally worshiped it. So you know, I think we, I just feel like, and this is, this is my hope and belief, like we're at the apex now of Donald Trump-ism where, you know, yes, people rallied around him for impeachment. It was kind of a rally around the flag. Yes, he had his return to CPAC. Everybody was watching. He got a lot of attention. But, you know, somebody once said to me, Americans don't solve problems. They move on from them. And I think people are just going to move on from him. And then there's going to be 
you know, the Sunday morning hangover that I talked about with you, you know, and you can either confront yourself or drink Bloody Marys. I think many decide to start drinking Bloodies, but it will be Monday again soon. And you're going to have to eventually make the decision to fix your life. So, but Josh Hawley, the, 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 the smug face, I mean, that, that really did capture it. The, you know, look at me, look what I did. I guess it's the, it's the way the whole thing on January 6th is being dropped into the memory hole. I mean, it really is remarkable. You know, and I was thinking about this yesterday, watching Christopher Ray, the, the FBI director, who was going through refuting one conspiracy theory after another, talking about what happened. And yet it is like the entire Republican Party, and you're still a Republican congressman, has just decided that they want to move on from that, too. That it almost yeah. like, that it didn't happen. And with every single day, they become more invested in denying what happened and in minimizing what happened. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. And that's what's concerning to me, too, is, you know, the insurrection was basically two months ago, which is not a long time. No, not. And it's like we're demanding that we move on from it. There's already people questioning the presence of the National Guard here. And, you know, and it's like, oh, we don't need a fence. We don't need the guard. Well, we did just two months ago. And, you know, so let's 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 not keep them here longer. We need to, but let's not be in a hurry just because we don't like the optics. And so, you know, with with Josh Holly, the reason that hit me so particularly raw is I watched that part of the speech. At, you know, I guess it was kind of in the middle of it when he's like, you might have heard I was you know, I objected to the thing and he knew it was going to get him mm -hmm. an applause. And he had there just kind of like with his proud mo and it's like literally se I, I, seven people are dead because of the false narrative that all you got to do is change the election results. All you got to do is just say, you know, Congress's job is to really just determine who they want to be president. And, uh, but there is no ownership from that. If I if I went forward with that tactic and, and what happened on January 6th happened, I, I would be there'd be a lot of self-reflection right now. I've gotten to know the officer, Michael Fanone, who, you know, was the one that was drugged down the stairs that they said shoot him with his own gun yeah. and was tased six times. That dude's a hardcore Republican, but was the most disappointed among everybody. He's like they were beating us with Blue Lives Matter flags. I mean, there was a orgy of evil that just like descended on the Capitol. And that is something we have to come face to face with, because if you wipe it under the table, it'll happen again. And when you have a president, a former president standing up and repeating the BS that this thing was stolen, uh, you can never expect that there's going to be some other organic awakening. No, and, and there is no introspection. Um, no, I agree with you. I mean, if you had any any involvement in that whatsoever, this would be the moment to look in the mirror and say, wow, how did I how did I get to this point? What did I do? How can I change all of this? Now, speaking of which, you've made one choice in the Republican Party, which is to to fight for this. And I want to talk about your super PAC in, in, in just a moment. Um, th there are others who didn't break with the president at all, have decided they wanted to stay within the womb of Trumpism. And then you had people like and I'm sorry to keep bringing her up again. You know, Nikki Haley, who mm -hmm. uh, has you know been for Trump and then anti Trump and then for Trump and then anti Trump. You know, Tim Alberta's uh, interview, she says we made a mistake by following him. We should never make that mistake again. Uh, then afterwards, she wanted to go down to Mar-a-Lago to kiss the ring, whatever. The president gives a speech at CPAC, which he repeats the big lie about the election, reads the names of his enemies list um, on the stage, and Nikki Haley tweets out, what a strong substantive speech. I mean, what, what is, is, is this part of some great scheme to triangulate? Yeah, I was yeah. really disappointed in that. So I've been disappointed in her since she's kind of done the back and forth. I mean, honestly, I think we're at this moment where you got to pick a lane, you know, are you yeah. country first or are you Trump first? I don't think you can, I don't think you can walk that middle road anymore. And, you know, for her, first off, if it was a powerful speech, I'd give her a little slack. Second off, all he did was regurgitate fear, you know, division, half the thing was on immigration and the hordes coming up from Central America. And it was like, all you had to do was unplug his speech from September and like put it in the past tense and, and now you got the February. So there's nothing powerful about that. And he repeated lies. So I was really disappointed because, you know, maybe I'm biased. I thought the speech was a boring and I thought it was, there was nothing new and it was just, I'm going to stand up and get, 
you know, for old time's sake, I'm going to get my adoration from the crowd. So I, it yeah. was, I think her tweet was obviously an attempt to try to assuage the people that were mad that she dared criticize. Okay. Then, then now, now do Mitch McConnell explain Mitch McConnell who, but the day before CPAC begins, goes on Fox news and says that, uh, well, yes, absolutely. If Donald Trump was the nominee in 2024, he would support him for another four years in power. Explain this to me. That's hard for me to do. <laughs> Look, I, I'm glad I was disappointed. McConnell voted against removal, but I, by the way, uh, Bill Cassidy gets a lot of yeah, credit in my book I, I and, agree. uh, we can go into that, you know, in some other time, but I, I, with Mitch, I was disappointed he didn't vote to remove. I thought his speech was great. You know, I, yeah. I, I do think he's trying to both sides a little bit, but I thought it was great. He's an institutionalist. I think he's a, you know, he understands power politics. And I think his point was if the face picks Trump, I'll, but, and I guess I can get it, it's okay. But the problem is, you know, everybody's sitting around saying, if the base, if the base does this, you know, the base has changed. So yeah, we've gained millions of voters. We've lost millions of voters. This idea that the base is this static thing that we have to comport to versus lead is wrong. You can lead the base to new and better things, which is what the whole country first thing is about. You can lead them to new and better things. You can bring new people into the base who say, boy, that's a vision I can get on board with that aren't Democrats. And, uh, but instead we have this idea that, okay, you know, this, this angry, you know, fired up base that's been fed a steady diet of years and years of fear. Uh, they're totally unchangeable. We have to use only fear and, you know, we can never add anybody to the base, but somehow we're going to miraculously come back and win short of a nuclear war. No, I, I, I guess I was a little bit surprised that he would have, um, that he would have made that statement. I guess my only the only explanation was that he didn't want to get to have three days of CPAC beating up on him. Uh, but you mentioned Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. So let's at least, you know, hand out a, you know, a few laurels here. Um, it's extraordinary, not just that Bill Cassidy is not backing down, but he represents Louisiana. That's got to be pretty hard for Trump country. I mean, he's got to be getting a just he's got to be in a world of hurt um with with fellow republicans and yet he apparently has decided number one he's going to stick to this and number two he must have some level of confidence he can do what you just suggested which is to persuade the base that this is not the right way to go i think he's he's taken the long view which is the right view which is you know first off he's not up in two years i think he's up in four mm -hmm. um but i think he'd have voted this way even if he was up in two years honestly i i've, I've talked with him I, I knew him when he was in the house he's just a good man and mm -hmm. he wants to do the right thing but you know he looks at it and i don't think there's anybody that with a straight face can think well maybe they think it but i could explain if i had some time to them you know that in in four years donald trump is not going to be the main player in the republican party and i really strongly believe you he's so. embarrassed of trumpism i don't know if that's in two years but i think it's definitely by four um yeah. but yeah you know he, he just basically said look i listened to the argument and donald trump was guilty and i voted to remove him that's what people should do that's what well, you should do why do you think that uh the the trumpism is going to fade away because there's a lot of folks who think look um one of the things that we've learned in the last two months is that there's nothing that is going to shake this this party. There's no one um, in the field who could beat Donald Trump if he got into a primary. I mean, how how you know? So what what is the alternative to that? Why should we not think that somebody named Trump will not be the Republican nominee in 2024? Well, I think it's a fair question, and I think it's particularly a fair question if nobody steps up the challenge, you know, and if. If everybody's just quiet and acquiesces to Trump's vision and pretends like we can still win a presidential election, even though we lost by millions and millions of votes, uh, then, yeah, then I think there, there's no doubt it's going to be, you know, Trump or somebody like him in, in four years. But I think I still think at heart the American people are good and optimistic if they're fed optimism and they've only been fed fear. And so, you know, as, as every day that goes by. People think less and less about Donald Trump. You know, Joe Biden, who I disagree with on policy, but I think is a, a decent man, 60% approval rating. You know, you had 45% of people at CPAC not list Donald Trump as their candidate. Yeah. Now, granted, it was all Trumpian people, but that's still some progress. And I just think we're so early that, you know, sane voices are going to arise and 
and take back this party that has a great history. They just need to be reminded of it. Well, one of the people, and, and I know we, I mentioned this right before we started the podcast. I know you haven't seen it yet, but Mike Pence has broken his silence. He's got a piece up at the Daily Signal, which is a publication of the Heritage Foundation, in which he's kind of doubling down on the, on the big lie about the election. He doesn't mention Trump's name, and he's writing about H.R. 1, which is the Democrats' uh, election bill. And he writes, the tragic events of January 6th, the most significant being the loss of life and violence in the nation's capital, also deprive the American people of a substantive discussion in Congress about election integrity in America. And then he goes through talking about the troubling voting irregularities which took place in states that set aside laws enacted by state legislatures in favor of sweeping changes ordered by governors, secretaries of states and courts, which is the same old, same old debunked, many times refuted uh, disinformation from, from Trump land. Mike Pence seems to be uniquely positioned to be the guy that says, look, I supported all the stuff you support, but this is wrong. We can't go this direction. And yet he's decided he's going to try to get back into the favor of Trump world, the megaverse. Yeah, that's what surprised me, because, you know, let's say he just stayed quiet now until basically the 2024 election cycle. And he could come out and, you know, he's obviously got conservative credentials. He has Christian evangelical credentials. He's got, I supported Donald Trump all the time. I mean, there was nobody that supported him more than no. me, but I'm against insurrections. And so he could have almost walked that line. And I think that's why I'm surprised. And, you know, that you're, uh, unless he, unless the view is that he can somehow go out and compete now in the Trump lane. But look, <laughs> yeah, were there voting irregularities? Yeah, there are every election. But that, the, the difference is saying, okay, there were massive voting irregularities and implying that it made Joe Biden president versus just, Hey, every democracy has concerns with voting, but that wouldn't change the election. You know, I mean, it's it's nuts. So uh, tell me about the super PAC that you're forming now. Well, so the super PAC is by allies. And as you know, there's mm -hmm. a wall there. So uh, there's not much I know about it, except that, you know, this this movement has grown to there. But the main part. So I basically decided after. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I remember talking with you and you said, do you think there's going to be upwards of 20 people to vote I to know. not certify? I and I said, this. I think there's going to be a hundred. And it was like, oh was my it, gosh. It was a gut punch when you said that. I do remember that. And it was yeah. turned out to be much worse. So. Mm -hmm. And the floodgates opened, right? So anyway, I thought that January 7th was going to be the day that we left Trump behind. Mm -hmm. And I was fine with it, good with it, great with it. And then I started to see, you know, Kevin McCarthy go down to uh, Mar-a-Lago, and then I saw the narrative of the NRCC, like we've got to win the Trump base, and and I just said, you know what, I I got to just tell the truth here, and so I created the video, uh, which was the first video we put up, and decided to start a movement with it, uh, and it's uh, countryfirst.com, one st, and it's got the two videos, including the one I released two days ago about fear, but the bottom line is, in 24 hours, we had. 20,000 email addresses of people that said, sign me up. The fundraising has been huge for the leadership pack part of that, the part that I can control. And, uh, and it's not, my intention is not to go out and use it as just a fundraising. It's to build and endorse and support through grassroots, a network of candidates that put country first. And it's a low bar, Charlie. I, I don't, I don't have a litmus test for anything you believe, except to say, you're going to tell the truth, not pedal in fear unnecessarily and put the country before the party. It's a low bar, but I think it eliminates, you know, 80 percent of people. So did you did you see that story in The Washington Post about uh, the, the the donors that gave certain uh, House Republican candidates eight million, 12 million dollars? Yes. These, these are people who lost by 40 percentage points. The, the, the grift on the right is truly extraordinary. Some of the same suspect, same people who gave, what is, it, what is his name, Kim uh, Classic, who raised, yeah. is that any, her name? Um, she yeah, raised more than Classic, eight, I think. Yeah, Classic. She, she raised more than $8 million in a race that she lost by 40 points. And a single firm, a company consultant, leech firm, took nearly half of it. And this it was repeated in a number of areas where you, you see what's happening on the incentive structure on the right, that the people become these video superstars when they have no chance to actually be elected, yet they suck up money from moms and pops all over the country. And that not only do they suck up money and then lose the election by 40 points, but it goes into the hands of some of these new, uh, obviously, profiteers on the right who figured out 
how to generate clicks and outrage and make this fake celebrity on the right. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon uh, that I think we're yeah. all going to have to cope with to understand what the incentive structure is among um, some Republicans. Well, let's think about this for a second. So, uh, the, you know, two big clients, I think Lauren Boebert was one. Yep, I right. mean, they've had a ton of clients. And then uh, Kim Klasick, and I, I think somebody that announced against me has used them. And, and it's kind of the same formula of, you know, I'm going to walk. It's the young, attractive female, yep. uh, you know, walking, telling the truth. And and what happens is, you know, if you're the candidate, now Kim Klasick, I think, came out and said, this is terrible. I didn't re realize it. And I give her credit for that. Um but they come to you and they're like, hey, we're going to make you a superstar. And now in politics, the, the incentive isn't to come here and legislate and get things done. It's right. to become a superstar. And so you look at even if you know they're going to take five million, in some cases, people would be like, sure, as long as I become famous, the victim here is sometimes the candidate. But for but it's the it's the people that, you know, have been suffering during the pandemic that believe in the conservative philosophy that want somebody to fight that's sending their hard-earned money only to be used, you know, by a new Corvette for these grifting firms that have just, you know, accelerated their profit making. Think of that. If, if that $8 million would have gone to candidates that were very close, we may have taken the house majority. Yeah. Uh, what well, it, it is, it, it is, it is extraordinary. And the point you're making here is that because of this incentive structure, you have people who go to Congress who are not interested in legislating at all. They are interested in being, the you know social media stars and we can name who they are uh people who you know who, who again are, are famous for being famous at this point without any legislative accomplishments and will never have any legislative accomplishments no. so adam you understand that you're experiencing a interesting phenomenon right now called the strange new respect right <laughs> <laughs> no, sort <laughs> you know. of maybe go ahead <laughs> so you know you're a conservative republican and up until five minutes ago you were this right-wing republican from illinois and now you're this major political figure who is gets profiles in the atlantic and the new york times and you're featured on cable television because you've been willing to uh speak out against trump you know what's about to happen to you right oh yeah It'll because turn. what's well, no, well, what's going to happen is that people people who were saying this is great that Adam Kinzinger is standing up against Donald Trump as a conservative Republican. Oh, wait, he's still a conservative Republican because you oh, yeah, are, that already aren't happened. you? I, OK, yeah. tell me about that. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, voted uh, against the pandemic relief, not because right. I'm against pandemic relief. And I'm also pretty I'm also fairly moderate on things like gay marriage. But I had to mm -hmm. vote against the Equality Act because the Equality Act included no protection for religious liberty and there were issues with female sports and and uh that turned into you know some of the flying monkeys that say oh my goodness it's all it was all a lie but that's okay because to me it's all there are a lot of people still that have stuck around and said look we never expected him to be you know anything but a conservative but we understand you know a lot of the support for country first has actually come from republicans republicans like you know, Charlie Sykes and people that, you know, go to the bulwark that are that feel disaffected or that are about to feel disaffected. Um, so you're going to have some some of that. But yeah, I, you know, I'm every day I recognize, you know, the the difficult position I'm in. But I also know, you know, I've put the career on the line and said I'm willing to lose for it. And that makes that that makes everything much more peaceful. Well, I think it's, it is interesting. And I've tried to make this point to folks on the left that that it is perhaps not reasonable to assume that that simply because a conservative says that Donald Trump defies conservative principles and is a danger to the country that therefore um, I am now going to become a liberal or that uh, I am now going to become a Democrat. No, no, no. The whole point of conservatives opposing Trump is because they see Trump as a danger to the values that they held and to the country, which again, putting country before ideology or, or party. But there is that demand that, that every once in a while will come up saying, you know, we don't want you unless you are willing to confess all of your sins and reject everything that you have believed until now, with the exception of the Donald Trump stuff. Yeah, and that's where, that's where the tribalism accelerates, not just on the right, but the left. So. You know, I've seen a lot of members, I won't name them, but they come out to, to Congress, particularly in the last term, um, and 
you know, they were a little antagonistic to Donald Trump as Republicans. And then, you know, they'd build this huge following and then they would support Donald Trump. And then, of course, they'd get the, um, what did you call it, the momentary celebrity or whatever yeah, that is. Yeah, strange new respect. Strange new respect. And then, so they would just look at that and go, boy, I can't win. I'm going to pick a tribe. And they just go all in for one side. And that's the problem because, you know, as politicians and as humans, we want to be liked. I'm not exempt from that. You know, we all want to be liked. And so the difficulty, you know, Mayor Holt, <coughs> excuse me, of Oklahoma City uh, put yeah. something on the bulwark that I've shared with a lot of people where he talked about, you know, the problem with politicians is they don't want to be not liked. So they won't tell people the truth. And I think that comes to play here too, which is, you know, a lot of times if you, if they turn against you, it's like, okay, I'll just, I'll just become a liberal then so I can be in a club or I'll just go to the Donald Trump way. And I just think we need more people, you know, frankly, like the bulwark has and like, I'm, you know, hope to be that are just going to tell the truth and, you know, the cost of the cost, and, but that's going to be the only thing that can change the political structure and tribalism. You know, um, one of the things that, that I try to do is try to explain sometimes to progressives, um, you know, where the middle ground exists and, and where um, they might blow it. So, for example, there's a very interesting analysis by, I'm sorry, what is his name? Is David Shore. I think he's a progressive who has been analyzing what's been going on in the campaign. And he, he has an interesting interview in New York Magazine where he's saying that the Democrats probably um, underestimate how many uh, votes they lost on the defund police issue that yeah. there there was real possibility with in, in the wake of George Floyd. But when you started talking about defunding police, not only did you lose white conservative voters, but that's one of the reasons why Hispanic conservative voters flip back um, to, to, to Trump. In fact, the one most predictive uh, issue for Clinton voters who switched to Trump was this concern about crime and law and order and defunding the police. And I, I wonder whether or not um, Democrats right now understand all of that. I mean, you're, you know, I mean, we're in this moment we're saying, where, where can we make common cause? Where can we not make common cause? And I think that one of the things we can do is try to translate, okay, if you say it this way, this is going to repel the kinds of people that you are going to need to create a coalition of the decent going forward. You yeah, that's I mean? right. And so, well, and part of the problem is the messaging. When you're messaging to the base, you're guaranteeing you're not going to find common ground. So, you know, when you're saying on the left, we want to defund the police, it may fire up your base. They may be good with it. They may know what you really mean, but the rest of America doesn't. When we say things like, you know, the stuff that we say, you know, yeah, it may fire up the base, but it's not going to win America. And so, I think, and this is the problem, is every issue now, every issue is binary. You're either on one side or the other. There's a conservative side and a liberal side. And I think we have to change the whole discussion. So for me, conservatism is real basic. It's just that a kid born in the inner city of Chicago should have the same mm -hmm. opportunity as a kid born in Highland Park, which is a wealthy suburb. That's what conservatism is. And all these other things around it, uh, you know, is to help to get to that outcome. So the idea, you know, we're always for tax cuts and never for tax increases. Well, I think we need to look at revenue when it comes also paired with spending cuts, because what I want is a sustainable government that is big enough to defend us, small enough to allow us to breathe. And I think if you begin to build the narrative outside of what it's been since 1980, you can begin to build those consensus again. So just real quick, you know, Danny Davis, uh, is a uh, African-American congressman in Chicago, good friends with him. He is as passionate about his community as I am. He knows his community obviously far better than I do. Uh, I happen to believe that there's a certain way to help bring success. He believes it's different, but we both have the same goal. And we've been talking a little bit about that. That's the kind of conversation that needs to happen. But instead, it's all, boy, how do I fire up the base and say something cool on you know, one of these TV things so I can send out a tweet that gets a gajillion retweets and a million bucks. See, now that's really an interesting point, because it, it, it seems that right now the ideological divide on some of these issues is, is, weirdly enough, narrower than it used to be, you know, on spending, on issues like the minimum wage. 
which may then explain why people need the culture war stuff, the Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head stuff to, you know, continue to inflame the, the base. But, you know, for example, I mean, you know, given the, the four years of Donald Trump, um, obviously, you're not going to have a lot of Republicans who are going to be objecting to sending out the, the stimulus check or, or, for example, on the issue of I'm jumping around here a little bit on the issue of the minimum wage. I mean, there's a there's a compromise there, isn't there? There, sure, there, yeah. there is a middle. If people would sit in a room with good faith and will say, OK, we share the same goal, but how do we get there? There might be different approaches. You want to raise people's wages. You want to get people out of poverty, but you don't also then want to destroy hundreds of thousands or millions of jobs. How can we best do that? That conversation can take place right now if you have people who are willing to engage in good faith discussions. You're right. So think about it. So four years ago in a debate, I actually called for raising the minimum wage. And that was back when I think $10 was radical. Mm -hmm. And I said, 10 bucks needs mm -hmm. to go up. And, and then they pushed the, the goal to 15. And so now, you know, look, if the Biden administration, for instance, would have come to me and, you know, granted, I'm not a senator, and that's typically where those negotiations happen, but said, what can we do on minimum wage? I'd say, hey, let's look at a number below 15 and a little bit of a longer time to get there, but then put an inflationary device on it that kind right. of comes every five years. We could have gotten to that. But instead, the left has the litmus test of 15 bucks or bust, and the right has a litmus test of nothing or bust, and nothing gets done. Is that really the Republican position now? Nothing? Just stick with, uh, was it uh, 725 forever? I don't know what the Republican position is because the only Republican position is no to the 15. And that's part of the problem. We haven't articulated alternatives. It's always a problem when you're in the minority. It's not necessarily specific to now. But I do think if you said something like $10, $11 over a sustainable period, given the fact that so many small businesses are struggling, um, I think you could get there with a, a significant number of Republicans, if not a majority. Well, I think that the Republican answer right now to uh, $15 or $10 an hour, the Republican position is Dr. Seuss. I mean, it's, right, yeah. it's, it, it, is, it is awfully interesting. Um, you know, it didn't even occur to me until yesterday that I haven't heard a Republican uh, talk about Obamacare repeal <laughs> in, right. in months and months and months. And yet apparently in that in that stim in the uh, stimulus package, uh, relief package, there's a rather significant expansion of of Obamacare. That's also struck me as an area there where there could have been some compromise. Uh, there seems to be, you know, broad consensus about uh, trying to, you know, prop up the economy, make sure you get the needles in, into people's arms, get people, uh, you know, back to work. Um, and yet, and yet, uh, again, I mean, there's there's hundreds of millions of dollars that probably are optional, which I assume is one of the reasons why you voted no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the whole stimulus pack package, somebody had done the numbers, basically, you know, direct payments of 1400 to Americans, you could actually take that to $2,400, get rid of the unnecessary stuff unrelated to the pandemic and still save a trillion dollars in this package. So 9% of it went to medical stuff, hundreds of billions for schools, but doesn't even take effect till 2022. So nothing for reopening and helping there. And then a state like Illinois that has been so financially mismanaged for decades, uh, for generations really, will get billions of dollars just to help paper over their fiscal mismanagement so they don't have to actually deal with it. So that's why, and that's $2 trillion. You know, I, we can get there on something big. And I think for states mismanaged like Illinois, you can have a carrot and stick approach to help, you know, the federal government to help them through this, but you can't bail out Illinois on the backs of well-managed states. Well, and also there are some states that that haven't really suffered financially. I mean, originally when we were taught, we were thinking about wh where did the aid have to go, there was a lot of concern that states would be financially hammered and that would, that they needed to get some sort of relief. Otherwise, they'd have to be laying off, uh, you know, firefighters and police officers and teachers. And now it turns out, well, maybe not. So there's right. like three hundred million dollars that you can do right there. But back to this issue of of compromise, I, I think that when when Mitt Romney came out with his proposal for you know a child benefit i think you saw kind of a new age of politics if you leave aside the culture war stuff the ideological difference um is 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 narrower and i think it's one of the it's kind of a paradox of our of our politics and um un, un, unfortunately i'm not that optimistic that people are going to sit in a room and find ways to resolve this well i think you're right uh about 
you know, the culture war being the driving thing here. And because, you know, yeah, on spending, look, you know, Republicans weren't, you know, t- poster book on spending. Uh, I would argue that Democrats have been worse already, but, you know, still, regardless, uh, we've got to get spending under control and we have to actually do something about entitlements. Everybody knows that. Nobody wants to talk about it. Instead, we just pretend like we need to cut the military to balance the budget. You know, the military's got its own. Like there is a lot of kind of radical solutions that can come forward that can be accepted. I mean, look at let's look at, you know, old smug face Josh Holly came out <laughs> and I think at the beginning of the pandemic said, I want to give like 2000 bajillion dollars to every American every month. I mean, it was a blatant, clear attempt to just you know play populist politics but he didn't catch any blowback from that on the right because you know i i guess the right understands that there is a role for the federal government uh the problem is is now they see that role as executing the culture war well also that that's a that that's interesting to me is that as long as you are loyal to donald trump you're given a free pass to make any sort of an ideological shift there's there's no yeah. there's no right or left. You can come out in favor of any proposal as long as you're loyal to Trump. That's going to be OK as a conservative. If you break with Trump and vote for something or, or advocate for something that's you know heterodox or not uh, traditional conservatism, that's a betrayal. That's a sign that you're a rhino. So totally. Just- and and I think what's happened is, you know, you have so many sources of information that come at you. And you're confused and you have sources on the right and left, you don't know what to believe. And, and you just find somebody you trust. So maybe early on it was, I don't know, Sean Hannity. Hannity now likes Trump. You decide I'm going to trust everything Trump says because he makes me feel safe and protected. And that's how you become kind of personality driven because, boy, Kinzinger may be a conservative, but Trump says he's bad. And I don't want to go to the process of going through all the nuances of what right. Kinzinger believes. Instead, I just want to listen to what Trump says and yeah. Corey Lewandowski and you know Miller. No, it's and it, it's obviously the 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 useful shorthand for some folks, unfortunate. So, Adam Kinzinger, keep up the good work, keep up the fight, uh, keep the faith, and appreciate you coming back on the podcast. Yeah, it was good to be with you. I listen a lot, so I enjoy your your commentary. I appreciate. It. We will have to get you back for for an update on on the strange new respect. And how you, we, you and I, you and I can share notes on on this. And thank you for all listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.